You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Today, we're going to dive into the world of operations and uh, process performance and things of that sort. My guest is a lady who is a consultant in that uh, arena, and she's going to share with us some ideas and experiences that she's had. Her name is Donna Dubay. Donna, welcome to the show. Thanks, Doug. So happy to be here. Yeah, uh, give us a little bit of a backstory of your journey, how you got into this focus area that you uh, are helping people improve. Yes, yes, for sure. I'll make it the short version. <laughs> for probably many of your listeners, and the same for me, my journey to entrepreneurship was not straight and narrow, but windy and curvy. Um, and so my background is actually in healthcare. I was an ICU nurse for a number of years. And you might think, well, what does ICU nursing have to do with you know, leadership and helping entrepreneurs? Um, and certainly there are some similarities. And so that's sort of what I had to sort through um, all these years to get here, right? Um, but I, I really really did enjoy the, the healthcare. I really did enjoy that, that high paced, fast environment. Um, but I found once I had kids and a family, the shift work became a little bit harder. And obviously, as I got older, it became a little bit harder. And so I shifted from there to doing online work in project management. So I would come into, you know, someone's business and help them manage a certain project, whether that was launching a new program service, or, you know, they want to write a book and needed some management behind the scenes. And what I found out was that a lot of entrepreneurs are looking good on the outside, but on the inside, they're drowning. So they're working 24 seven. They're not sure how to lead, how to manage. They want to grow to the next level, whatever that is for them, but they're at full capacity and don't know what to do next. And so from there, I really moved into helping that leader one-on-one -on -one through consulting to really be able to let go of some of the day-to-day -day operations in their business, to set up systems and processes, to know how to hire, how to fire when we have to do that, and how to lead and give our team autonomy so that we can step away from that day-to-day -day and refocus on the vision and the strategy, which is what we need to do as CEO and leader of our business. So now I really help them leverage three things, their time, their talent, and their tactics so that they can grow to the next level without you know, sacrificing their life, their family, their health, all those things that sometimes go with this journey of entrepreneurship. Those are uh, great points. And uh, I, for one, don't see a, a problem with that connection. I, I can only imagine imagine what an ICU nurse has to do in the way of uh, not to dehumanize it, but mm -hmm. every patient is a bit of a project. They mm -hmm. they come into the system in a certain way, and you want them going out another way, and and there's a process to get them there, and and triaging along the way, making pivots and adjustments and changes to the treatments and the work that's being done. So uh, it, it really is project management on a micro scale. Yes. And uh, so I, I certainly see the correlation. So it's interesting that you, you have been able to do that. And I agree 100% with everything you said about most entrepreneurs are inundated because they've allowed themselves to kind of get sucked into the vortex of the business, whatever it may be. And they have not spent the time and attention to building process, building systems, mm -hmm. and developing others in the business to mm -hmm. take on the day to day. So that's a that's a huge burden. When you first start talking to an entrepreneur, uh, say a new engagement, yeah, where do you typically go? How do they show up? What are the questions you like to ask them to get things started? Yes. So when they come to me, Doug, it's normally I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. And some days I just want to burn this whole thing down. <laughs> right? When yeah. they're there with a bad day. Yeah, let's be real honest. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and so many of them have somewhat of a small team, you know, three, four people. They're mostly contractors, but some have full-time employees. And they're feeling like they're, they have these people, but they're not gaining from it, if you want to put it that way. They feel like the team is always coming to them 
you know, they're the bottleneck in many cases for a lot of things. And that is the truth sometimes when you get in behind the scenes because we haven't set up those systems and processes to allow the team to be autonomous and to make decisions within their scope, within their realm, right? Um, and so really a lot of times we start with what are the things that are coming to you frequently over and over, right? Because they're on the top of the mind of the business leader. Oh, they're always asking me X, Y, Z, or this process is really clunky in my business. I have to go back and forth several times. And so I like to start there with those, those items that are top of mind and really help change the time that the leader is spending in the business. Um, and so get some of those day-to-day -day things off of their plate. So if we can move some of those off of their plate, have the team members more autonomous in doing them, now we say, okay, we've just saved you two hours or three hours a week. Now let's dive into what you're doing for tactics and strategy and how are you going to use those two or three hours that you just got back? Because it's all wonderful to hire a team member and have them take something off your plate, but then you have to use that time you got back intentionally. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's when we'll institute things like what I call a CEO power hour, which is really just a one hour date with yourself to review and reflect your business. And you do it each and every week. And the reason you do it each and every week is because we're creatures of habit. Right. We want right. to be on top of the pulse of our business each week so that we don't go two or three months and be like, oh, yeah, is my revenue on track? Am I still getting new leads in? right? We want to be looking at those things continuously. And when we're looking at them frequently, that's when we can take a little tiny snowball and break it up before it gets too big, right? So if we notice something isn't on track, that's when we can now use our strategy. Okay, what can I do? Maybe my sales are down. Okay, do I need to, you know, review my, my funnel? How is it working? Are people actually converting? Do I need to reach out to some people one-on-one? -on -one? you know, to see if they'd like to, now is a good time for them to join, invite them to join you. Or maybe life happened and I actually didn't promote any of my programs, products or services for the last month because, you know, <laughs> something happened in my life, right? And so getting back on track to making sure that we are continuously marketing and continuously selling to the people in our audience. I, uh, I I like that idea of that reflection, and and you sprinkled a couple of magic words in there that I'm a big fan of. One is intentional. When you start talking about time and availability of time, and if you can identify some things that create time for you, you're right. You you need to be very intentional about how now how are you going to use that time. Mm. And the other thing, you, you started that thread, you, you packed a lot in there, and <laughs> we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. You started that thread talking about that idea of identifying the things that seem to be repeating. I had a guest uh, last year, the whole show, we talked about, he, in fact, he wrote a book titled, Don't Repeat Yourself. Mm. And it, it's the idea, of, and that's not a communication training book, it's a, it's a practice book. And he was right on that. It was like, if you're owning a business and you have this perpetual thing happening time and time and time again, take a look and see if there's not someone on your team that can do that thing for you. Yes. And um, I had a client once who had a one step in a process that was happening frequently mm -hmm that involved uh, filling in his social security number on a bank form that had to be submitted. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want his office people knowing the numbers, so he insisted that it, uh, everything flow on his desk. And he was a busy guy, and deals had a tendency to get backed up and stacked yeah. up. Yeah. And when he hired me, we were doing just that. We were looking at the repetitive things. And I said to him, you know, well, well, it's your office manager that's doing this flow for you. Do you not trust her with that information? Mm -hmm. She's going to see it eventually because the document's <laughs> going to come back around. Why are you the one that is keying it in? And he thought a minute and he goes, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? And I said, yeah, <laughs> maybe so. And you yes. said it, I didn't, you know. Well, this is it. But you know what, Doug, that's exactly it. Is And I have the same problem. That's why we hire coaches and consultants, right? Is because sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. 
right? Yeah. So right. yes, his first mind was, this is my social security number. I need to keep it safe. Nothing wrong with that thought process, right? But then when you actually look at what's happening, you're right. You've hired this person. They're on your team. They're working for you. You've trusted them with many other parts of your business, right? And they're going to see this data down the road, right? But sometimes it just takes someone, you know, pointing that out to us or questioning or asking us in a different way for us to be able to see the other side. Right, right. It is, is it, well, I'll just ask it is, is there a pattern that you see with entrepreneurs that is a, a very typical starting point? Yes. So what I see happening a lot is that and understandably, we all start normally as solopreneurs. We're doing everything, right? So we may have the label CEO, but we're really chief everything officer because we don't have a team. We don't have anything. We're trying right. to get something off the ground. Um, and as we grow, we end up staying in that vicious cycle and forget to take a step back and say, okay, how can I make changes here? How can I set up processes? And we have to remember when we are delegating to a team member. It doesn't always have to be a team member. We have so much software available to us now where we can automate steps of a process, right? I'll just take our podcast here today. Obviously, Doug needs to be here to interview and we need to have this conversation, right? We're not going to put another team member in place for this. However, Doug can have a calendar that'll show me when he's available and I can book in a time. We don't have to go back and forth on email to say, Tuesday at two o'clock? No, right? If there's any editing or any producing that needs to happen, that doesn't need to be Doug. He can hire that out to a team member, right? Getting things ready for social and email afterwards, letting me know that the episode is live so I can share it. All of that can be done behind the scenes so that you as business leader, you have certain responsibilities within the process, but then your team and or your automations take care of the rest. And so having that set up and having that vision of, okay, I'm going to start a podcast, but that doesn't mean I'm doing every piece of it, right? Right. Break it down and see what do I need to do as a business leader and then make sure I've got time on my calendar to make that happen. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. And again, it goes back to that idea of just taking an honest look at all the details, your, your you know, day in the life kind of an analysis to, to really take a look at all those many things that you've heaped on your own plate. And, you know, there's a phrase that's been used a lot and I'm, I'll confess I'm a little bit weary of it, but you, it's undeniable truth. You, entrepreneurs need to be able to work on the business, not in mm -hmm. the business. And that is so vital to be able to look at that bigger picture. You know, what are my next growth opportunities? What is happening in my market or in my industry? Uh, is, is there a new opportunity that I haven't explored yet? It, yeah. And, um, I I have a client who bought a plumbing company uh, mid middle of last year, and did just that. He quickly kind of um, worked through the alignment of the team that he had, and he was quick to delegate a lot of the day to day that the former owner had not done, and that let him available to attend some workshops, some webinars, and some other things about the industry. He discovered there's a, a, a specialty tool that is available that essentially represented a whole new line of service for his mm -hmm. business. It, it was not cheap to get the tool. It was about an $80,000 investment, but he got it, sent two guys to a training class, and the very first job they went on, because this is a pretty significant service, was a $15,000 ticket. Yeah. And yeah. that client was wildly satisfied and referred them to another mm -hmm. property owner. And that one was literally 20 times bigger See? and yes. engaged them for an annual contract that had a bottom line value or top side, excuse me, value of $500,000. Mm -hmm. So the long point of that story is if he had not had the time to go explore opportunities elsewhere in the industry, 
he wouldn't have identified that piece of equipment and that process to add to his service package. Yes. And he paid for it, you know, four times, five times over. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But if you or if someone had come to him at the beginning and just said, oh, there's this new thing, you pay $80,000, the mind says $80,000, that's a huge investment. No. Nope. Right? Without right. having that time to think about it strategically and critically. Yeah. Or or the idea of saying, I, I, don't, I can't do a new thing. I, I, yes. I don't have control on my old things. I, yes. I, I want to do a new thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know I was working with a client once who She's a course creator and she sells courses to new grads coming out of university. And so in her mind, she was thinking, I need to be on all social media channels because that's where young people are. And so she had a social media assistant who was working pretty much at capacity and she wanted to be able to do more. And so she had come to me and said, maybe I need to hire another social media assistant but I'm worried about the budget. I don't know if I can you know, afford having another one. And so I challenged her to say, let's look at the data and see what the return on investment from our current social media assistant is. We were just doing organic, no um, you know, paid ads by any means. But what we noticed when we got into Google Analytics was that out of the two, all of all the channels she was posting to, two of them, we're actually giving a return on investment. One was brand awareness, so bringing people into her world, and the other people were actually taking action and you know signing up for a webinar, or purchasing a product, whatever the, the post was about. The other channels were hardly getting any traction. And so just having that objective data made it so easy for her to then make a decision. Well, I don't need a second person. Let's drop the channels that you know we're not getting traction on, double down on the two channels that we are focusing on, and my current team member can handle that, right? And so without having to blow the budget and bring on somebody else and do many things, which were not giving us a return on investment. So I think it's really important to do that type of measuring. And no, you don't have to be a data nerd to, to do that measuring, but to really be looking at, okay, I've put this strategy or this tactic into place. I've had it going three or six months. How is it working? Right? And if I'm enjoying it and it's working, great, let's keep going. But if it's not, let's let it go. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's a great example of, of being being able to do that critical thinking about what you're what you do have going on, what you've already committed to, and whether or not there's any return to it whatsoever. And there are, again, going back to process and systems, there's so many great tools now that you genuinely don't have to, even if you've hired a person, that person doesn't have to just go click on five, six, seven different platforms to post things. There, mm -hmm. there, are, there are tools that will manage that for them and automate the posting process. You just have to focus on the creation process. Right, right. And, and even the scheduling can be automated. So it's such a you know better improvement. I want to shift a little bit and let's talk about process and mm -hmm. process mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my first basic question is, if you think back on <clears throat> all of your clients, how many of them had done a good job of mapping out exactly how they want the, the work to flow? <laughs> um, if you want the truth, not very many. <laughs> It's more of a fly by the seat of our pants, right? right? And, you know, I think some of that too is innately how entrepreneurs are because so many of the entrepreneurs I work with are visionaries, right? They're quick thinkers, quick movers. They've got a lot of good ideas coming at them, but actually being able to, you know, sit down and map out how would this process work and the details, that's not their strong suit, right? That's no. not what excites them. It's not what gives them energy. And so, like most of us, we kind of avoid those things that we don't really enjoy doing. Um, and so most get to a point where they have several offers. The marketing and the sales system is not clearly defined for each of those offers. Um, and just, you know, again, sometimes we have to slow down to speed up. So if you're coming to me and you're like, I'm at full capacity, I don't know how we're going to grow anymore. Right, then do we have a marketing system for each of your offers? Do we have a sales system and a delivery system for each of your offers, right? And if we don't, then let's slow down and put those into place. 
because there's so many assets that you, you make and you create that we can now put in rinse and repeat mode, right? Sure, we're going to tweak a little bit the next time we offer it, but we're not starting from scratch. But right. if we don't have that process mapped out, we're starting from scratch the next time we want to, you know, market or sell that thing. And so that's wasting a lot of your time and also your team's time. Yeah. I, I agree with you. A vast majority of entrepreneurs show up in the visionary column of idea making and maybe it's an invention or, or just a, a, you know, a service idea. Mm -hmm. And they do when they get in that ideation mode, it just, it starts flowing like lava, you know, it's, yes. it's, it's hot and it's, uh, there's a lot of it. And, you know, the, the team that might've been assembled can actually suffer mm. a kind of a whipsaw effect. And, and they just get, it's like, what are we doing today? Oh my gosh. You know, which, which yes. thing. So I think the word to those entrepreneurs that, that may find themselves in that mode, you, you've got to be careful. And uh, there is a book by Gino Wickman that was a follow-up to EOS and Traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's called Rocket Fuel. And he argues that for a business to be successful, you, you do need the visionary, but you also need an implementer. Mm -hmm. You need a person that's going to take those visions and turn them into action. And... If, if you are that wildly visionary entrepreneur, the best move you can make is to find a colleague or a partner that's going to be your implementer. Mm -hmm. And if, if you search out that rocket fuel title, there is a link. There's an online assessment. You can determine if you're a visionary or an implementer. Yes. And, and you can kind of better align any partnership you might be in or even within your team that you might have personally built, you might have that implementer that you really need. And the, the biggest challenge there is to avoid the shiny object syndrome. Mm. You know, you get an idea, you launch it, you work it, you start seeing revenue and you get excited and say, okay, what's next? And it's like, well, yes. we haven't finished perfecting this first one. Why, yes. why are yes. we going Let's get some momentum, else? right? Yes, for sure. Right. And one thing I do with my clients to try and help in this area is that, yes, you know, beginning of the year or the end of the year, looking forward to the next year, we set up what's our strategic plan, right? What's our plan for the next 12 months? We've got our vision. We've got our values. Now, what is our plan? But we break that down, that plan down more. So I break it down into actual 90-day goals and then down into monthly goals. And the reason for doing that is because then we know, okay, we're coming into first quarter. What are the three or four or seven or whatever number our, our team can handle? What are our projects for this quarter? And when we have our team meeting, the business leader is actually discussing that with our team, right? This is our vision for where we want to go. But for this quarter, we're focusing on X, Y, and Z, right? We have a discussion. Let's get team members input. Let's get their buy-in so that they also know this is the direction we're rowing the boat and they can row along with us, right? Right. It also helps keep us as a business leader grounded in, okay, for the next 90 days, I can just stick with this, right? And like you were saying, that implementer, that person you have on your team is that sounding board. So when you come and you say to me, oh, but I wanna do this, this, and this. Okay, those are great ideas, but here's our 90 day plan. If we add those ideas in, our team doesn't have capacity to do both. So we're either looking at adding more team to get this done now, pivoting and getting rid of something we've already thought was a good idea, or we're putting this idea in what I like to call the idea parking lot. And so, yes, we actually have a place for it, Google Doc or your project management tool, whatever you need, but we put that idea in there. And then before the next 90 days, we're reviewing what's do we want to do in the next 90 days, the next quarter, and what's in our idea parking lot? And then we can adjust, mm -hmm. right? So those things aren't lost. They're not, you know, sitting in the dust and, and gone, but we really have to look at what aligns with where we are now and where we want to go. And that is a huge challenge for that visionary entrepreneur of, of throttling back. Mm. And uh, I've heard it described as a spectrum where, 
One end is the frenzied activity that almost creates burnout because people are just so wildly scattered. But the other end is sheer boredom. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this thing. I want to do something new. I, I got to go on. Yeah. And it, there's a balance in there somewhere that ought to be the, the needle. And certainly there's no harm in pressing your team to do a little more, do a little more, but it needs to be with intentionality. Like we, mm. the word we started with Yes. you. And, and I like your idea of committing to that planning process. So you agree, okay, these are the hurdles we're going to try to challenge or accomplish, mm -hmm. overcome, you know, in the next 90 days, six months, one year, whatever. But when you say that to your team, you got to stick with it. You you can't yes. 10 days later go, hey, you know that thing? Let's forget that. Let's go over here. Let's end it. Right. That's what right. drives people crazy. Yes, it's true. And, you know, I think about it as channeling the business leader's energy. And so if we've decided we're going to do this thing and then business leader is getting bored, that energy has to be put somewhere else. And it's not necessarily your business. So if we've got a program offer a service and it's going well and we want to keep doing it and build some momentum, but your board is business leader. Let's give you a different passion project outside of your business for some of that energy to go towards, right? So there's hobbies, there's passions that you have outside of your business. Put some time aside to delve into those. Maybe you want to look at a, a charity. Maybe you want to get back into, you know, dancing or some hobby that you had that you hadn't done in the last few years because you were so enthralled with your business. And so just channeling that energy into different spaces, I think helps sometimes so that that boredom doesn't only have to stick with our business. We've got something else that we, that we also enjoy. Well, and you mentioned in the planning process, you know, to be able to have that implementer person that can be the sounding board, but there, there is another alternative as well. And that is, if your business has reached any level of scale, you probably should consider having an advisory board mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, two, three, five people, maybe that, that, you're you're not necessarily paying them anything, you know, maybe you work out a deal for, you know, profit share performance or something like that. Yeah. But these are trusted advisors that can agree to come in and really learn your business, know it, and be available when you've got this wild new idea, you know, mm -hmm. and you can say, look, you know, this bolts on here and this goes there and da 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 da. And the board can say, okay, I get it but didn't you have a strategy you wanted to follow for a year? You know, why, why are yes. we not staying on that path? Yes. And yes. It, it can become that literal sounding board to, to run those ideas, perhaps even perfect the idea. Mm. You know, a lot of times these visionaries, their ideas are a little half baked. They're close, <laughs> but as the saying goes, no cigar. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they need some work before they just, they're thrown in the implementation pile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, having that other capacity is, is a big boost. And I know in, in my own 16 years now of, of doing this coaching and advising work, yeah. the companies that have that advisory board, their continued track of earnings growth and profitability for the business is much more stable, much more consistent, and ultimately greater than the the entrepreneur that's still trying to go it as a lone ranger, you know, mm -hmm. running the company. Yes. Yes. For sure. You know, it does we need a tribe. <laughs> that's yeah. the bottom line, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And and you know, two heads are better than one, you know, all of that yeah. because you Again, these ideas may be wonderful, but you know they they need to be really vetted and analyzed and challenged for whether or not it fits into the product and service mix you might be trying to deliver. Yes, because uh, just because you think you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. <laughs> right, right, exactly, right. I always like to look at new ideas. You know, can we? make the promise if we, we can deliver this, right? So do we have the team and the capacity to be able to do this? 
what's it going to cost us to be able to put this in place? And then, of course, what's the risk, right? And is it yeah. worth that risk? Um, you know, like your example of your your client who was the plumber. Yeah, someone might have said, well, that was a big risk in investing in that. But as we can see, he could see the return on investment, right? right. Um, <clears throat> you know, so it was worth the risk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let me shift gears a little bit and ask, ask another thing. In, in your work with these companies, it, you know, inevitably you get you do get into the people element of things. Mm -hmm. From your view and recent experience, do you see any particular changes in the mindset of the workforce today? Mm, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would yes, be. <laughs> I think for sure. Um, so a couple of things have happened. This online world has exploded in the last two or three years. And with that, we have people who are working for those companies also in the online space, but the expectations aren't always as clear, I think. And so working from home does not necessarily mean, you know, I can get out of bed when I want to, I can sit on the couch and, you know, if I show up for the meeting, I do, if I don't, I don't. There's a level of professionalism that still needs to be there. And I think sometimes without having certain standards and expectations, that can get blurry. And so I think it, it falls on both sides. It falls on the, the team member who, you know, is going to be hired, but it also falls on the business leader in terms of how we do the hiring process, right? If I want to hire a team member and I needed it yesterday and I threw up a Facebook post that says, I need help quick, you know, I need a VA tomorrow, I'm probably going to get what I asked for. <laughs> yeah. Right. For sure. Um, and so taking the time to actually follow, you know, the best practices in hiring makes a world of difference because you want to put your company as a best foot forward. You want to show your values so that you are also attracting people who align with what you're doing and, you know, how you want to move forward. Right. So by having those values in your job description, by talking about them in the interview, you are really setting the other person up for success and saying, yes. I can grab hold of this vision. I can grab hold of this mission and work with, with this person and where we want to go. Um, and so really taking the time to do that process properly, I think, makes a world of difference. And then once you do hire them, having some sort of onboarding, we have to remember they can't read our minds, right? And so we need to have some things in place so they can learn about our business, what services we have, what, you know, our mission is about, the language we like to use, our clientele and what our customers are about, how our customers think. Um, all of that is is necessary for the person to really get a handle on what they're doing. And you may think, well, I'm just bringing the person in for five hours a week, right? That's what you're starting with. But that could grow over time, right? And so, you want to be able to bring in the people that you want to be able to keep and, and, you know, stay with you and grow with you over time. So doing that process right from the beginning helps along the way. Right. Every time I think about the, the whole idea of needing to hire people and expand a company, I'm, I'm reminded of something that uh, an old HR friend of mine said that Generally, most companies, even the big ones, have the whole people management equation upside down. They mm. they hire fast and they fire slow, and, mm. and that needs to be flipped. You need to hire slow right. and fire fast. Yes. And, yes. and I realize, depending on where you are in the spectrum of employee engagement and the size of the, your business, the firing part has a lot of legal ramifications and there's yeah. procedures and steps you have to address. But nonetheless, generally, even a, that aside, most managers don't deal with underperformers quickly enough mm -hmm. and it becomes a kind of a cancer in your business. It, yes. it demotivates the good ones and encourages bad behavior elsewhere. Yes, 100%. Teams are looking at this bad performer, bad egg, whatever, and and they're saying, "Well, they can get away with it. Why? Why should I be, you know, doing what I'm doing?" Yes. And so that's why it's so important if you're if you own the business or you're leading a team, you've you've got to be quick to identify the problem, remedy it if you can, maybe with extra training, extra resources, or whatever. But if you can't, 
deal with it, get them off the payroll and move on. Yes, yes. And I think that's the thing, Doug, is that we we sometimes like to move that into more the emotional and the, well, I kind of like Sally Sue, right? But the truth is, you know, if this person is not performing, it's not about whether you like them, right? It's not about the personality. It's about what you're having them do in your business. And mm -hmm. if they can't meet the expectations and the standards that you set, and, you know, and you've given them the resources that they need. And, you know, if they need training, whatever that is, they're not meeting that, then it's an objective decision, right? Remove the subjectivity that, well, I like her, that might be fine, but they're here to do a job. Right. right. Um, and I think, you know, having those not all corporate, but at least bringing in some of that into your small business in terms of, okay, I've hired you, here's 30, 60, 90 day success goals, right? Have those clear for your contractor or employee right from the get-go so that they know in 30 days, this is what's expected of me, 60 days, 90 days. It makes it much more easier too when we're evaluating, okay, these were your objectives for 30 days. We met this one and this one. These three, no. What are we gonna do? Okay, these are the steps we're gonna do, right? To try and remedy that. But we have a process in place so that it's not just going on. And, you know, it's like, when we need to have a difficult conversation and we don't want to have it, we want to push it under the rug, make it go away, right? right. But the longer we make it go away, the harder it is to have. Correct. So stay right. on top of it. Have that difficult conversation if you need to up front and be objective. Well, and all of that goes back to the point of having an effective onboarding process, because when you're onboarding a new employee, that's the time to talk about expectations and obligations. And both parties have those. You, the employee certainly comes with expectation. I, you know, I wanna get paid, I wanna get a bonus, I wanna get da da da. Yeah. And, but, but a question that never gets asked is, okay, that's fair. What are your obligations? What are you gonna, mm -hmm. what are you gonna deliver to be eligible to get those things? And you go, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. Right. And, you know, <laughs> But the point is, during your onboarding process, if you're if you're doing a good job of setting those expectations and discussing the obligations, that's your foundation. Mm -hmm. Then when performance doesn't match up, you can point back to that starting point. Hey, remember the day you came here and we talked about this, that, and the other thing? That's where we're failing here. That's where this is not working. And mm -hmm. You've, it makes that difficult decision a little bit easier. It, it never makes it go away, but yes. uh, the difficulty, I mean, but uh, it makes it a little bit easier than it might otherwise be. Yes, yes, for sure. And I think the other side to that is as business leaders, we have to be evaluating on a regular basis. Do I have the right people in the right seats? Right? Totally. Because again, we might hire someone and then they grow with us their job description is no longer what it was when we hired them. We haven't gone back and really updated that. And, you know, they have a certain set of skill set and area of expertise. Are we tapping into that? Right. And so, again, I like to do that on a yearly basis, at least. Um, if we're growing rapidly and we need to do it more often, no problem. But at least yearly looking at, okay, who's on my team? You know, have I asked them where they want to go, where they want to grow? And, Am I, you know, giving them the opportunity to do that? Yeah. Well, Donna, this has been great. I think we're about up on time for today. And thank you so much for sitting in. Tell everybody the best way to get a hold of you if they're interested in knowing more. Yeah, sure. So my website is CEO Amplify, and I have a podcast with the same name, CEO Amplify. So you can check um, both of those out. And um, certainly if the CEO Power Hour, that one date with yourself once a week resonated with you, then I do have a playbook that you can download and sort of walk you through the steps of how would I implement this in my business and uh, just helps you get started. Very good. Well, that's, that's great information. And as always, folks, we're going to have those links in the show notes for you to just uh, hop down and click on. You didn't have to write it all down. You can always refer to the note there. And I 
Also at this point, I'd like to remind everybody, we do have a video version of this over on YouTube, channel by the same name, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Jump over there, check out the archives, leave me a comment, let me know if you've got an idea of, or a question on another topic area that you're interested in pursuing. We'll be happy to respond and see what we can do. But uh, one last time, Donna, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm going to sign off, tell you to go out there, make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.